when you were in Arizona, did you ever have to use the bucket for Arizona for feces? Yes. Uh, did you have to use it for urine? Yes. Because um, you you're, had to urinate in the room on occasion, how how was the did the room smell at all? Yes. What? Well, how did it smell? Uh, I mean, did you, was it bad? Petrid. This morning, we're shining our opening statement spotlight on the horrific allegations surrounding Tim and Tracy Ferreter. They're accused of locking up their son in an eight by eight box with nothing but a mattress and a bucket, no sunlight, keeping him there for up to 18 hours at a time. And they claim that they did it all because their son had behavioral problems. Their son took the stand on Wednesday, describing his father as aggressive and his treatment as dehumanizing. Was there any, ever any physical aggression towards you in Florida? Um, there was instances of uh, grabbing and pushing, but otherwise, no. Were there times where uh, he was verbally aggressive to you in Florida? Yes. Did you like being in that room? No. Um, did you want to be in the room? No. Uh, did, how did it make you feel? To me, being locked in a room it's dehumanizing. Never thinking of what an adult would think to, a, to do to a child that would succumb his or her efforts in daily life to succeed. Suffering from emotional pain, suffering, trauma. Oh my gosh, so much to say about this, right? Let me bring in my guest. She's an award-winning, nationally recognized parenting and family relationship expert, Dr. Sue Kornbluff. Dr. Sue, good morning. It's so nice to see you. Uh, and I can't wait to talk to you about this. I mean, you are a best-selling author as well. You wrote a book called Building Self-Esteem in Children and Teens Who Are Adopted or Fostered. So what do you think about what the ferreters did to the child? <laughs> well, let me be frank. There are different ways of parenting your children. Yelling at a child is considered, we're making mistakes, right? We're, we're being controlling at times. Putting a child in a box is child abuse, Julie. There is no doubt about it. And there are so many more things that you can try with a child that has been adopted than going to coercive methods. It has been proven over and over again that coercive methods do not work. And what they do do is cause severe trauma for children who will have to cope and deal with that for the rest of their lives. I'm with you, Dr. Sue. Preach. I want to bring in another guest who knows so much about this. He is the former director of the Department of Family and Children's Services in Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. Tom Rawlings joining us. Tom, good to see you. Uh, let's good talk morning, about Julie. what could have been done better. Because uh, I, I, yeah. I, I, I'm sure I know that you're going to say this was atrocious, what was done. What would be a better solution, please, Tom? Well, so I think there are probably families out there who may be struggling with children who are having behavioral issues. And I think we have to remember that when a child, especially at a young age, and many children who are adopted out of foster care or perhaps internationally, have suffered a lot of adversity in their childhood, they suffered trauma, they have not had a trusted adult to be there for them. So it is incredibly important for uh, family members uh, to surround that child and give them a trusted adult to whom they can attach. And so there are plenty of options out there. There's a program called Trust-Based Relational Intervention, which an organization I work with uh, teaches to caregivers. Uh, and th as, as Sue said, the, the last thing you do is to treat these behaviors as somehow willful. These are merely symptoms of a child who does not feel that they are cared for and does not feel that they have an adult whom they can trust. Uh, and of course, we all need to be aware of, and schools need to be aware of it, and we all need to be aware of children who are in this situation and report it mm -hmm. if we see it. Mm -hmm. Right, Tom. I, I mean, without a doubt, uh, this kid was acting up. He, he, he was a bad teenager. He was. 
but does not justify putting him in a box, uh, in my opinion. I want to play a clip where he's on the stand. He's talking about how sometimes he wasn't able to eat dinner with the rest of his family because he was in the box. Would you eat dinner in the room or with the family? In the room. And um, are there some times on occasion that you would be allowed to eat dinner with the family? Yes. Most of the time, though, where were you eating dinner? In my room. And when you're eating dinner in the room, are you locked in the room? Yes. I don't know how they aren't ashamed of themselves, hanging their heads in shame, letting the world hear this. Uh, Dr. Sue, back to you, please. When it comes to what damage this might have done to that child mentally, emotionally, mm -hmm. what are you thinking, please? Well, first of all, I'm thinking this is complex trauma that is going to affect his life for a very, very long time. You know, he did testify in court yesterday that he said that his parents just made a mistake. This is not a mistake, but many times children will have what we call Stockholm Syndrome, where they do not blame the person that is treating them so poorly, they connect with them. He's going to have so many difficulties later on in life, building trust, building self-esteem, feeling safe with people in relationships. This is why when we are taking in an adopted child, we need to be aware that they come with issues of abandonment and exiling them to a box or any kind of barbaric treatment just exacerbates the original trauma. Children that experience adoption need unconditional love building trust and a sense of safety where if they make mistakes they're not punished for it Julie they're comforted and told that you can do it differently mm -hmm. exactly they need to be educated and be taught why the behavior is wrong how to rectify the behavior going forward yes, yes. that clip about him saying my parents made a mistake I I'm, I'm with you dr sue that was like the moment of the day where i think many of our jaws dropped and those of us who've worked in the criminal justice system have seen this type of thing before where it was very sad to me my heart broke when i heard that because i thought he doesn't Mind even you. realize how victimized he is here. And so I want to play that clip for anybody who might have missed it. It came out on the cross-examination, actually. Yes. And you saw uh, defense counsel uh, uh, seem to uh, get pretty happy when she, when she heard the answer. Let's watch. Do you think it's hard to think of good memories when everyone around you has a bad image of Tim and Tracy in their mind? I don't have a bad image of Tim and Tracy. They just made a mistake. I believe that they weren't trying to do any harm. Yeah. I believe that... I, b I believe that people should recognize that that was a mistake and forgive them and move on from move on. Mm, and I can't help but notice the priests there. Priests are all about forgiveness. You know, God bless them, of course. Uh, but in the law, you know, the, the law isn't about forgiveness. The law is about following the rule of law. If you break the law, you can be punished. Uh, Tom Rawlings, what did you think when you heard that child? say that he doesn't blame them? Well, you know, Julie, in my 23 years of working with children who have been victims of abuse, they often, I mean, they do, they love their parents. And in fact, you know, this is what they're being deprived of is that loving, safe relationship. And so I can understand him saying that, but it doesn't excuse the behavior of the parent. Uh, it, you know, it, a, a simple Google search by these parents would have real, would have shown in 10 minutes what Dr. Sue is saying, which is that children who have experienced childhood adversity, who have been adopted out of a foreign nation, often need real serious therapy to, to help them attach to the family. This is not willful disobedience. This is a symptom of a child who didn't feel loved and didn't feel safe. And there's no excuse for the parents in this situation. They should be held accountable in some way. Mm -hmm. I've got another clip for you, Tom and Dr. Sue. Uh, this was from a pretrial hearing, a recent hearing, just a couple of days before they picked the jury. You're gonna see defense counsel describing to the judge an incident uh, involving the young son and the smearing of feces. There was a time when um, 
the child at, at the same age range was had, um, I don't want to speak about it, you know, I don't want to, it, it, he had essentially used the bathroom on himself, feces were rubbed all over the wall, Savde Borzadi walked in and it was, burn, uh, RF was the only person there, it was rubbed on the wall. Okay, certainly crude, rude, and socially unacceptable. We know yeah. that. Uh, but I have to wonder, well, why is he doing this? Why? What's going on with him that, that's um, having this kind of activity, you know, manifesting uh, itself in, in the family home? Uh, Dr. Sue, what do you think of when you hear about behavior like that from a young teen? I think, Julie, that this is someone who is so frustrated, is so demoralized, feels as though he doesn't matter at all. They're treating him like an animal. And so therefore, he's taking his feces and rubbing them all over because that's how he is feeling inside. Dr. Sue Kornbluth, Mr. Tom Rawlings, always great to get your expertise on child abuse cases. Thank you so much for your time this morning here on Opening Statements. And a reminder that the Ferreter trial resumes at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. We're going to take you there live when it does. We're going to hear from some uh, mental health experts uh, today. Dr. Wade Myers is going to be the first witness up called by the state. Uh, Dr. Wade is a professor of psychiatry and human behavior at Brown University. And we're also set to hear more uh, and see more of that ring video um, featuring uh, the child in that box. When we come back, we're going to take a look at the very latest in the Idaho student murders case. As a roommate who was not attacked...